sister to take Nino down, but on the gangster side of the equation, we got a badass sister, Vanessa Williams, Vanessa Kennedy, fine ass up. Vanessa Williams. Well, she's here. Probably getting popcorn or something. Oh, there she is. That's enough. Drop the bomb, baby. So, and then, to be one of my New Jack cops to take down a New Jack gangster, we got my buddy Jeb Nelson, who's Jewish, who has been to the Breakfast Club already. He came in, he was ready. We got Russell Wong, who's Asian, talented Asian brother. And uh, and we got Ice Steve, who did not want to play a cop, to play a cop. And the very talented Mr. Wesley Snipes, which can play the gangster. And of course, brother Chris Rock to play Pookie the victim. Yeah, he's still a victim. No, he's not. No, he's not. Uh, and and you know, Chris Rock told me, he said, Bad people, you ruined my life. I still walk down the street and people be like, Pookie, I got you, son. I got you. I'll hook you up. And, and I played the police commissioner and said, Do it by the book or I'll have your ass. And so that was my, my karmic justice. I hope you enjoyed this movie. Last minute thing, when this movie came out in this theater, 31 years ago. Wow, oh, 31 years ago. It's no Super Mario. Yeah. Black on black, brown can stick around and white is all right. When this movie came out 31 years ago, uh, there was a scuffle outside. And they have, people had been watching a video all weekend long where uh, a fellow, a motorist named Rodney King was getting his ass whooped by the cops. 
And so when the police showed up and there was a huge line that they'd never seen before like that in Westwood, there was some pushing and shoving. And someone said, let's get them back for Rodney King. And so a scuffle broke out. And they later on the news were saying, well, New Jack City's causing riots. What movie were they there to see? But it turned out the people had never seen the movie yet. So unless the poster, which is a dope poster, was an incitement to violence, it didn't make sense. So I went on the news to, to take it back and said, um, you guys are switching it up. And this movie actually says, this is one of the few gangster movies, typically in a gangster movie, you emotionally connect with the gangster. If you watch Godfather, you connect with the gangster. If you watch a gangster movie, you emotionally link up with the gangster. But in New Jack City, you connect not just with the gangster, but hopefully with the cops, but even more so with the victim. And when we showed New Jack City here, I was sitting in the back, and this brother stood up in the front row when Chris Rock was getting addicted to crack and said, Just say no, motherfucker! <laughs> and I knew at that point that we had made a gangster movie that de-glamorized drugs and showed the truth about what crack will do to you. And so that was a good start. I hope you enjoyed the movie. Some of your tricks, but the whole thing for that. Yeah, these are, these are, I didn't have them when I did this. Um, I hope you enjoyed the movie. Ask me some great questions afterwards. If you want to ask any questions that aren't that great, ask my daughter, Maya. She's right back there in Marley. Just hit her up with shit. You want to give her a script that you want me to produce about a guy who broke out of jail? You give it to Maya. <laughs> Not these two. All right, love you guys. Thank you for coming. I'll talk to you after. Um, thank you, Paris. Thank you, Paris. Um, this is Blake. Um, and I'd like to welcome all your back to the stage. All right. Woo! Woo! See, that was before we had the punk ass drone shots. That's some helicopter shit for your ass. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm a little comfortable. Just to start from how, how, seeing 30 and 30 minutes later, and <laughs> it's, a, it's a trip. This is, you know, there was so much happening in that film. There's a lot of, you know, first of all, 90s was a lot of energy. We shot in New York. Uh, so, I mean, there's so, there's so much to tell you. I had, what had happened was, I was, I was, I was living uh, in Hollywood. And I was keeping my overhead down. I'm not a materialistic cat. My dad had always said, modern day slaves are not in chains, they're in debt. <laughs> and so, because I knew I wanted to act and direct, and you know, everyone wants to act and direct, so you don't know what that's going to mean. So it's like you're taking a certain amount of your time of your life and you're gambling that I'm hopefully you're going to make it, but you don't really know. And uh, so I was living on the kitchen floor in Hollywood for three months to turn into three years. And I was getting close to thinking of quitting the business. I was like, maybe I have to go back and try to try to get into the business side. But I got a movie. I got an audition for a movie called Heartbreak Ridge with Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and I got to play this character, the Ayatollah of Rock and Roll. And uh, Clint doesn't look like me. He doesn't vote like me. But he turned out to be just a great ally. And he introduced me to Warner Brothers where I met Terry Selma, the Warner Brothers Brass, and, uh, and Bob Daly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my great aunt always said, luck is preparation meets opportunity. And I, I was prepared. I started directing a lot. You know, I started directing, I have a TV series called Sunny Spoon. So why is that it's called Sunny Spoon? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, it's all good. Uh, and then I, I directed Sunny Spoon, and then I directed a TV show called 21 Jump Street. The two kids down in that and Richie Franco. So I did a bunch of those, and then I did uh, Ken Wall. Um, Wise guy. Ken Wall. 
So I had been directing, but I just didn't tell people because, you know, I, was, I have to audition sometimes as an actor. And I didn't, when you're behind enemy lines, there's no sense in running your mouth, right? So what happened was, I guess Spike was busy. They had a, a, a black gangster flick, and they needed a negologist. <laughs> and Clint had, Clint had thought, you know, you know, Clint had introduced me to them, and they were like, well, this boy, Mario, seems kind of cool. And, and they had made a deal for a movie called Bonfire of the Vanities with Bruce Willis and uh, Tom Hanks. So they were, and Scorsese was great. This is a big movie. The it's Palmer. Big and so <laughs> they basically gave us the Scorsese's catering budget to make the movie New Jackson. <laughs> and so I went to New York and, brother, I was ready. I was ready to do this. And they, the only caveat was they wanted me to act in the movie, Warner Brothers. Because there were no names. You couldn't find out. Where's Kip? Are you here, Kip? Where's Kip? Okay, that's my buddy Kip. We were talking about this the other day. You couldn't have financed New Jack City Farm because there were no stars, really. I, I had just done Heartbreak Bridge. Jet Nelson had already been at the Breakfast Club. Uh, Wesley was the guy from the Michael Jackson Bad video. Ice T was a rapper. Um, but the movie was the star. And so. We, they did it as a negative pickup. It was not initially having the Warner label. We just did it independently. And then Warner picked it up. Um, so we took a lot of risks. Uh, and I wanted that whole movie to be, I wanted to have like a feeling of a gangster classic, but at a whole new rhythm. You know what I mean? And, and bring it to folks with new colors, sort of a heightened reality. So you see a lot of sort of Dutch angles. Like I said, okay, here's New York City. And boom, he was New Jack City. You know, so we were doing, uh, took, a, took a lot of license there. Um, and then I, I used metaphor, I used a lot of metaphors as a filmmaker. So I said the, the modern day gangster is like a vampire, and the lost souls are the, are the junkies. So that whole, I wanted Wesley to always appear in around kids that were dead and with stone and with gold, but nothing alive. And you know, Scotty's also in black. I had Scotty, Ice T's character. Always around books and children and things that had a life to them, and and I went to them and I said, I see you are you are the king of the jungle, and then I went to Wesley and said you're like the Black Panther, you're the king of the jungle, and so I would rehearse them separately and then they would come together, um, and you really see it. I mean their energy. You know, one of the things about being a filmmaker is I realized is that a big part of it is getting out of the way. Getting, finding the best actors you can get who can kill it, and then find out what makes what, what we love about them. What do you love about Ice? What do you love about Wesley? What do you mean? finding out? So I spend time with my actors and figure out. Oh, I like that angle. What do I like about this personality? And Wesley would just do shit. I mean, I would just, I would just get out of the way, man. He would just bring it, and then Jump would bring it, and Ice T would bring it, and so and, and Chris Rock. You know what I mean? So a lot of times I. Uh, is being egoless enough to get the fuck out of the way and let your actors kill the game. Create a stage where they can dance. Create a stage where your actors and your crew and everyone can bring their best work, their A game, and then you're going to have a movie. It's really incredible that you say that. I have to say, I was a student at UCLA uh, 30 years ago and remember very well. Um, uh, what happened with the premiere of New Jack City, but I was really struck by the way you're describing those characters on, on film. They look beautiful, <laughs> right? Just these nice looks incredible. I see is gorgeous. Uh, I got to meet Vanessa Williams earlier tonight. Again, stunning. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we were watching it also noticing that incredible opening of the film, this bird's eye view that we get, and of course the media speaking over it, the news clippings and so on, and then we get this incredible view from the street. Um, there are some other people from the film here tonight. I wonder if you can point some of that. I think there are producers here. Maybe some who are working on it. If you win New Jack City, stand up, baby. Yeah, yeah. We want to acknowledge you and thank you for this. Vanessa, Vanessa, you. You, know, you, you said something key that I, I, I look at, and I've had the advantage of growing up with Melvin Van movies. So, 
the perspective that that gave me, having my father in the business, was was ginormous. And that I saw what happened in the '70s, and the doors got shut on what they call black cinema, right? And so, in 1991, my father made the top grossing independent hit up to that time. He did it with a multiracial crew. He did it independently. And, and I asked Daddy, I said, it was called Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song. Ooh, ooh. And I was a kid working on that set. And I got to see, you know, my dad bring his A-game to a very challenging situation. So I had a great advantage growing up. You know, I didn't grow up with a dad who was a rapper or a ball player. Or, I grew up with a dad who spoke multiple languages. He spoke Dutch, French. Never thought that interfered with his blackness. He worked with people of all colors. Um, and he made a hit when he changed the game. So I grew up seeing that. And so it's kind of like if you grew up as Margaret Thatcher's daughter, it'd be very hard for some, some man to convince you as a woman you had no place in politics. So I grew up seeing Dad do his thing. I was like, oh shit, if I'm talented enough and lucky enough and prepared enough, maybe I can bring my game to it. But what you just said interestingly about uh, us being beautiful on that screen is so important because check this out, brother. At that time, if you wanted to, to, if you were black and you wanted to lead a movie, you were in comedy, right? And check it out. In Heartbreak Ridge, I'm not the leading guy. I'm the best friend of the leading guy, and I'm the funny guy. And if you look at Streets of Gold, Wesley's not the leading guy. He's the best friend. He's the funny guy. And Eddie Murphy was killing it as the funny guy. And Whoopi could kill it, and, and Richard Pryor, and even Cosby, as the funny guy. So we were, if you could make the dominant culture laugh, like the court jester could make the king laugh, you could get away with saying damn near anything, right? Because you could make them laugh. But it took Mario Van Peebles to see Wesley Snipes as R. Al Pacino, as the star. It took Spike Lee to see Denzel Washington, not as the funny guy or the best friend, but as the star. It took uh, John Singleton to see Brother Lawrence Fishburne, not as the best friend, not as the guy going up river in Apocalypse Now, but as the star. So until we saw we as leading men and then leading women, we weren't in the game. But once Wesley made movie money with New Jack City, well shit, Hollywood's not just white or black, it's also green. So what happened was, Hollywood said, well, he made money for Mario's film. What about us? We could use him in Passenger 57, and it's not written black. And then, no, he made money for Mr. Spike Lee. He did a rather good job, that fellow. We could use him in a Pelican Brief with Julia Roberts. You feel me? And Lawrence Fishburne, he did. Well, Mr. Singleton, well, let's put that fellow in this. And so suddenly, we had to see ourselves as capable of carrying a movie, and then they did. Now, it wasn't enough that we saw ourselves. They, the movies had to make money. That was the point. The movie had to make money. The, my dad always said the golden rule was he who has the gold makes the rule. So the, the movie did have to make money. But that was a huge step. That, and, and so that was a game changer, because then those brothers could go on to, to play leads in films. And I was in a very unique position as a director, actor, or actor, director, that something weird happened to me. I was in the position of being part of changing the game as a filmmaker and part of receiving some of the benefits as an actor. Because the next polygram came to me and said, well, why don't you start in a Western? And I got to make posse. Right? And so they were like, oh, shit. If they can make money from us, we can make money from us. And, and uh, so, would you guys like to see another posse, another Western? Yeah. Oh, right all right, cool, that's good enough, because I'm, I'm taking notes. Um, so yeah, so that was, what you're saying is absolutely true, is that we had to see all kinds of our beauty. That was so important, and, um, and a game changer. Now, one last thing. When, when my dad did Sweet Bat, and he did it independently, the studios had a, a film written by a white guy named Ernest Heidelman. And uh, they saw Sweetback made money, and so they said, let's cast our movie in black. And my dad had a, a group called Earth, Wind, Fire do his soundtrack. And so they, got, they did this second movie, this other movie, uh, and they called it Shaft. And they got a young brother from Stax Record named Isaac Hayes, he was 24, and they did Shaft, 
in black after Sweetback made money. And then after that, Superfly came out. Um, and so what was interesting, the Black Panthers loved Sweetback, and they said Sweetback was about a brother who uh, basically is a street sex worker, but he goes from a me mentality to a hustler mentality to a it's about us mentality, to I am my brother's keeper mentality. So they liked it because they said Sweetback made being a revolutionary hit. They also posited that Shafts was a great film, but it seemed to make working in collusion with the system with the man hit. And Superfly made dealing drugs against your own people hit. So they, they said, be careful, because the, 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 the icing of the cake looked similar. You know, revolutionary looking brother with a cool facial hair and fly clothes, good soundtrack. But the revolutionary core of the cake was slowly being drained out. And, and so you, when you really look at it, you go, oh, that's the difference. When they do it versus when we do it. And then they shut the door on black film. And, you know, Hollywood makes a lot of Vietnam movies, theme movies, and they stop making money. They'll say, well, oh, people aren't interested in Vietnamese uh, Vietnam movies. They make a lot of Jaws. I didn't make Jaws movies. Not my best work. Um, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Shark don't like spicy black meat, you know. <laughs> um, and, and they, after a while, shark movies don't make money. They'll say, oh, shark movies aren't making money. But they won't blame it on the color of the actors in the movie. Whereas if they're making Pam Greer, this or that, they didn't say urban action flicks aren't making money. They said, it must be the color of the actors. So they shut the door on And that's why in Posse, I made it a point with my Western to use Woody Strode, to use Pam Greer, to use Isaac Hayes, to use Melvin Van Peebles, to use Lawrence Cook. So I said, I want to see the Posse in the 50s, the, the 70s, and the 90s. So we, with the difference is that 20 years later, you see that 20 year gap. So 71, my dad did Sweet Back, and the those movies come out. Then we do, I did this, Mike was doing his thing, Singleton was doing his thing. And there's a 20 year gap. Because that next that next audience person, the young kid is watching and going, damn, I want to do that. That next boy or girl is out there going, I want to do that. And that's the beauty of it. Oh, sorry. I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned um, earlier when you came up. And um, you just mentioned about seeing ourselves and things. That, this film, um, this sort of predates all of these debates we're having now about diversity and all that things. Because you, uh, the cast is, is quite different even for that period and even from now. Can you speak to that a little bit about the decisions you made in the cast? Yeah, I, I mentioned that a little bit when I first came up, was that my, I have I have a great advantage, dude. I'm, my family is hella diverse. So I literally have grown up loving everybody. I went to Altamont with my mom, who was the, the ultimate cool hippie chick. Blonde, blue eyes. I went to Black Panther meetings with my dad, who's the ultimate, you know, brother don't, you know, revolutionary, red, red, black, and green your ass quick, you know. <laughs> Uh, and everybody in between. So I kind of grew up with that spectrum. And then we had lived in, I was born in Mexico. That's why you don't get a lot of brothers named Mario, right? <laughs> but I was born in Mexico. That's a long story. And then we lived in Copenhagen and Denmark, so I speak a little French. Um, so I have an advantage of seeing the mosaic of humanity. And the, the great advantage to that is not just you're, you're sort of seeing more than one cultural truth, it's also you see that we have a, a tendency, tendency towards global tribalism. What do I mean by that? When you go to India, you see beautiful brown skinned folk, they all look basically the same, but Hindus fight the Muslims, and yet they're brown. Irish, got a nice accent, so do the British, but they kill each other. Look at what's happening in Ukraine, that's a white on white crime, you see? So, and you go to Africa, and. We're the same color, but we fight each other. So if we were all, the truth is, if we were all purple, we'd fuck, figure out a way to buy west side purple, your east side purple. We have a tendency towards global tribalism. The Chinese fought the Japanese, on and on and on. So once you understand that, you go, oh, I get it. It's not really aimed at me. It's actually, there's something in us that can't, we tend to otherize people beyond a certain size, right? So as hunter-gatherers, we get along at the size of a film crew, as a matter of fact, about 50 to 100 people, we can get along pretty fine, right? 
And then we go, this is our crew, and we all know the, our position in the pack. He's the director, she's the camera operator. So we all know our position. But if you get us in groups of a thousand, you got kids, right? You send your kids to school, and the, the school is the thousands of people. Your kids aren't going to have thousands of friends. They're going to break off into a smaller clique. To be the emos, the, the jocks, the, the so and so. So we naturally tribalize. So the advantage was, I was like, oh wow, it's not the the system's aimed against me. It's just not. It, I just had to look at it a different way. Once you see it as not, it's not. It doesn't hate you. It doesn't mean that it can't hurt you. But once you understand that the lookism, sexism, racism, classism are just there for you to step on over them shits. You know what I mean? Step on over. And, and once you say, okay, that's it, I'm just stepping over it, it could hurt me, but I know everyone else is seeing the same thing. And so that's a great advantage because then you said you walk in the world in a little differently, which made it easier for me to learn from a man like Clint Eastwood or Michael Mann or my mentor Stephen Kim, none of whom look like me, you know what I mean? But my dad had taught me to shut up, although you wouldn't know now, but, but you know, talk less and listen more unless someone asks you some shit and then talk the arrow. We all know, we all have a camera, right? Everyone's got one within. Of course, in the 90s, you know, around the time of New Jack City, the world had also come to see images, obviously, of the brutal beating of Rodney King. We know that this wasn't the first, it wasn't the only, but it was certainly one of those moments where the world was having to confront up to a painful reality that, that many black people and brown people, of course, were aware of. So again, now that we all have cameras, we know that this also has sort of changed. Right, that visual culture. So, how do you think this has impacted you, or has it uh, this new sort of access to um, video cameras for everyday people? Do you think that's had an impact on the way that you tell stories, or how do you even tell stories about black life, urban life? I, I do. I think, again, having having a diverse family and seeing how people react to it is interesting. I remember once my mom was talking to someone during the, the uprising in 92. And one of her white friends, and they said, the friends seemed to infer that um, black folks were just looking for a reason to riot or loot or whatever. And my mother said, I was listening to my mother on the phone, she did not could hear her, and my mother broke it down for her. She said, listen, if folks were looking for a reason to riot, they would have rioted when they saw the tape. But because people in the black community have been aware of this treatment, this is separate America, a different America, so because they were aware of this treatment for years, they, it wasn't new to them, it wasn't new to us. But when the rest of the world got to see the treatment on tape, and those nice folks in Simi Valley still came back with a verdict of not guilty, implying that somehow Rodney King was learning a new type of jujitsu and beating those cops up with his face against their billy clubs, that's when people went off. Because they're like, even when you have the tape, if you were just looking to riot, you would have riot first, am I right? So suddenly we're like, no, man. It, 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 if you look at the history of what happened, this is deep, because you go back with my, my dad's film, Sweetback. When he made Sweetback, there's a scene in Sweetback where Sweetback, like I said, is this black sex worker, male sex worker. He said, anybody's going to be exploited, it's going to be me. My booty will be up on the screen. So, my dad got nice booty, so it's all good. So, so, and he put my booty too, by the way. So, anyway, you can see a lot of bad people's booty in that movie. I ain't going to lie. So, um, in the scene, the sex worker gets, you know, he's with these cops, and he sees the cops pull over this kid, and a black kid, and who's a, a bit of a militant, and they just start to beat him down. And they beat him and beat him and beat him. Now, when black folks in the hood saw that, they were like, yeah, we, we've, we've observed this. But there were no video cameras back then, right? The reviewers, now you have to understand, we're not, we don't control the media, here's the trick. So when you're, when you're making a film, you have to understand the people reviewing your movie don't have your experience, especially back then. So this guy reviews my father's movie. He says, not only, is Mr. Van Peebles' movie flawed and that you can't understand the dialogue? It's, it's 
garbled, and the images are dark and grimy, but the story is based on something that would never happen, that officers, good police officers of the law, would beat someone up for no reason and use excessive force. So he just did, you know, here's the deal. Here's the, here's the, here's the, here's the thing. When you're white, it's hard to tell because every SAT is geared towards you. Every president looked like your daddy. Every vice president looked like your daddy. Most school teachers look like your daddy and maybe your mom, right? So when, when the system is geared for you, you don't have to know abonics. It is through your language. We have to be by multicultural and code switch, but you don't, right? So he, he when, when a white reviewer would read my dad's film or saw my dad's film and had a right on it, if he didn't understand it, he would say it didn't work. But a black reviewer might say, I don't always understand it. My father called the guy up. <laughs> and he said, I'm not asking you to change your view at all. I just challenge you to go see Sweet Back in the hood. And to his credit, he did. He saw it. He was amazed. He left. He said, well, no, they understood every word. Oh my goodness. There's a whole world that I knew nothing about. So he couldn't review the movie. He realized he, he recused himself from reviewing the movie and said, I can't review it. But I can review the phenomenon of the movie. So what's changed since then? So Sweetback does what it does. I do my thing. Spike does his thing. Singleton does his thing. Then we get the sisters coming in. Stacy, uh, Casey Lemons, all these beautiful directors coming in. Ava, all these wonderful directors. And now I think most of America has an idea of what a bonix is. So I think the difference is, there's, when, when you go to the Black Lives Matter protest, I saw the whole audience there. There were white folks, black folks, young folks, straight folks, straight folks. So I think, I think most of America now has become more aware that there are two Americas. And, and, um, and we're mixing. And look, you look at a TV commercial now, man, you see blends and Integration, woo, they must be mad over Fox News. <laughs> I mean, I came to the airport once, I had been in Africa, and I flew back, and I had to land through Atlanta. And I went to a newsstand, I was going to a newsstand, I ran to the newsstand, and they had Barack Obama on Newsweek and Time, they had Tiger up on some golf, Sports Illustrated, Michelle was on Vogue, I mean, it was just like Negro Central. And, and there was a little Jet magazine like, how do you define yourself as different now? You know, so so I think most of America is is aware now. These movies, what you're showing, what you've got, and thank you to the cinema tech. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Because these movies changed the cultural game. And, and, and people, kids grew up, and I, I've had white kids come up to me who said, I grew up, I saw New Jack City, now they want no parts of crack. After that movie, we didn't gloss it, floss it at all. Thank you so much. In that spirit, we should hear from the audience. Uh, we're excited to hear your questions. Yes, right here in the front. Oh, uh, I just want to say, first of all, this movie was amazing. I saw it when I was a kid. I was a kid. I was a kid. Great question. Did you guys hear that? No. This is probably smart. You, I can see why your mom took you to the damn movies. Yeah, mom. Mom. No, no doubt. I see. I'm a work for hey, I, my agent's over here. Give me money. So he was asking, did we want an emotional connection with with the gangster, and were we concerned about the balance? I was. Here's the deal. It was my first feature. I had been directing for a while, like I said, but it was my first feature, and. Um, 
when you when you shoot your first feature, it's kind of like going into a haunted house with a gun, but you only have three bullets. So you can't shoot at every ghost that comes along. You gotta you gotta act cool and be like, oh, oh, oh. you know. But don't you can't really pop your gun off at everything. You have three bullets, so you just gotta gun for your bullets for three things. One. Get a great director of photography that knows when to paint and knows when to make their day. Two, get a first AD who really knows what they're doing, is the kind of voice you want to listen to because they're going to be yelling at some point. And the first AD does not want to be a director. Three, get the best, most ass-kicking cast you can find. And after that, oh. <laughs> okay. So, when I read the script, I said, wow, this script is strong, but it did read a little like a black star face. Yeah. And I said, like, ooh, that's tricky. Because the, the, the original gangster pictures were made during Prohibition, and Prohibition had ended, so it was like, ah, it used to be like that. We could enjoy the villain, but that's not even around anymore. But crack is still a killer in the black community today, so there's a different responsibility with that. I was like, oh, I can't just go and pick us out and just... Not, not, not be conscious of that. So I said, well, what if we could make it feel more like, instead of just Black Scarface, more like a multi culty Untouchables? And that, yes, De Niro still had the badass role, but against Kevin Costner, Sean Connery, and Andy Garcia, you had viable, alternative role models to say yes to. So if you wanted people to psychologically say no, you had to give them role models to say yes to. And then what if, in the context of that, you, you, you have a victim you have that makes the crime not victimless. And, and we saw two guys for that role. One was named Martin Lawrence and one was named Chris Rock. And Chris Rock killed it. Now part of what I also knew was that um, when directors started recording sound, we lost a lot of our power. So back when we were shooting black and white films and, and um, silent films, you could talk to Mary Pickford, you could talk to Charlie Chaplin, you could talk to Buster Keaton. Kind of like a directing a photo shoot. So you can say, Buster, feel the clock, look, look up, climb up high, the, the, the bird's coming. And I could, you could talk to him through it, right? But once you started recording sound, directors had to go action and cut. And then you'd have to give your notes afterwards. So we lost a little power there. So I thought, well, Chris Rock is so good with the comedy, and comedy's the flip side of tragedy. What if I did most of his tragedy without sound? So if you look at the stuff when he's got the crack pipe and he's got the American flag shirt and he's got the heavy emotional stuff to do, a lot of that I did like a silent film. So then I could talk him through it. Feel me? So, so I was able to talk to Chris do this, turn, feel that. And like when Scotty touched his back and he, he jumped like that to give him that whole thing. And then I just take my voice out in post and put his breathing in and bam, you have it. So part of it is really getting to know your, your actors so, like I said, you can bring out the best in them because every, act, every actor is going to speak a different language. Wesley speaks an entirely different language than Scott, than, uh, than I see. So that is what helped with the balance was saying, like I said, the opening was, could you give them role models to say yes to? And on both sides. So if they like the cop side, they could see the sister who was the prosecutor. If they like the gangster side, they could see Vanessa Williams. But you can see yourself reflected. You can say, I can get with this, or I can get with that. <laughs> Everyone who touches crack in this bad boy, it doesn't work out too well. Do you know what I mean? So that was, was super clear. So in a weird way, this movie was actually, I did a movie called Panther with my dad, and that's actually the prequel to this, because it was after black folks started getting militant that they started letting a lot of hard drugs in the black community, and I think in the hopes of medicating the communities, and I think it, it, it did its job. So yes, that was a big concern, um, and that was one of the joys was that people, you know, people found a way to see it and, and, and go, yeah, I knew there was going to be some folks that go, Nino Brown, CME, I understand that. Um, but there would also be people who go, man, I don't want any part of that drug, you know, yeah. Um, with the, the um, events at a number of the openings, didn't the press um, blame the film for all that, or, or you look at yeah, even though it's my strategy, it's still Yeah, yeah, and I, I spoke about that a little bit earlier, was that, that's correct, that this theater, 
people were seeing the, the, the Rodney King video and they were pissed off. And, and I went on TV and I said, look, if you, if you look at what my movie does for cops in between Judd and, and Ice-T and, and uh, Russell Wong, we, we portray cops a lot better than y'all did with your own reality video. You know, so so they, they couldn't stay with that too long. They, you know, I think, I think the problem was black films, films by us, written by us, we started to make do money at the box office, and they were like, "Yeah, that was done." Oh look, right here. Question for me: How much time did you spend in New York before you shot this? Oh, how much time? How much time did I spend in New York? You mean prepping for the movie? Yeah. So you, because you want the aesthetic of the East Coast. Yeah. Well, I live there. Oh yeah. I, 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 from 15 on, when I got my dumb ass kicked out of high school. I had to go live with my rough ass dad, which I did not want to do, but was the best thing for me as I look back. Because you know, I was at that age where I needed to be around dad and, and get my academic game on. So from 15 on, I, I was on the East Coast. So I, I was in New York, I was in Harlem, I was hanging out. So I, I, had, I had all the vibe. I knew where to go, you know, and, and, and then again, like I said, I, I wanted to capture parts of New York that, that had that old sort of gangster vibe, those old archways down under the bridge, you know, that's up on 125th right there, you know where that is, where the Cotton Club is, you know where that is. Um, so yeah, I grew up, I did all the theater around there, so that, I'm a New York boy. Uh, yeah, and then when I came out to LA, that's when I was living on the, on the kitchen floor, so I've been there for a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, great job, by the way. Uh, I was one of those young cats that flocked to the theater opening weekend with 20 of my best friends to see New Jack City. Thank you for that. Now, here's the thing we've often talked about. By Nino Brown being killed, there was no chance of having a sequel. However, <laughs> have you ever considered like a reboot, like how they're doing like films that were done 20, 30 years ago, and they're doing them, like they're remaking them uh, at that particular time, or remaking them at the current time? Have you ever considered that? With this fantastic movie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Yeah, you know, periodically people have come up, and I think there's a couple scripts floating around where people are trying to think about that. Um, I think Wesley so kills it in this, didn't he? You know, so, uh, um, I was so proud of that, brother, you know. Um, so I don't know, you know, what the point of view would be. Again, I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm a cat, like, people will approach me with stuff, and I'll get that right script and go, absolutely. So I didn't know I was going to make roots because I wasn't. I, I didn't want to do something about it, it, enslavement. But I said I'll do something about empowerment. So when I did that, I brought that energy to it. So part of the joy of doing what I do is that I, I don't know what's going to happen next. I didn't know you were going to ask me that question. You feel me? So I might go out tomorrow and say someone may say, "Yo, I got that film from New Jack." Now the thing is, Warner Brothers would control the title. You know, so you have to go through the Warner machinery to do it. But I think there's something to be said for it, and, and a lot of people have tried to do something New Jack-ish, right? I mean, Ice T went on to make a whole career sort of playing a character not too far from that character. Am I right? Yes. Do I have advice for someone who wants to direct and, and, and possibly star in it? Yeah. Okay. So that there's a I have a, some beautiful advice for you. Uh, this is the advice my dad gave me. He said, "Go out and learn Kipling's if. If you can keep your head on all about you, are losing there is a blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, yet make allowances for their doubting too." If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or lied about, don't give way to lies or hate it. Don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think but not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster, treat those two imposters just the same. Now skip ahead to the last verse, which is, if you can talk with the crowds, nor lose your virtue. Walk with the kings, nor lose the common touch. If neither loving friends nor foes can hurt you, and if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds of distance run, then yours is the world and everything in it. Which is more, you'll be a man, my son. 
So there it is. And then, be humble, be humble, have fun, and practice, practice, practice. Do it on your phone first. Do different things. Try it out. So you're not rehearsing in front of every damn body. You know, learn, learn, learn your craft. Yes, sister. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Um, you're studying my son wearing a wolf pack all the time ago in Westchester. You came, and I really appreciated you being there. Um, my question is about that scene where the cops were walking on the water, and you were carrying that beautiful baby. Um, what was the impetus for that scene, and where is that baby now? <laughs> oh, beautiful. So, did you guys hear the question? Yeah. <laughs> so, here's the thing. Um, I, I think since I saw the Jackson 5, I always wanted to have a big family. I was like, I want to have a bunch of kids. I'm going to have fun with them, and I'm going to hug them up and love them up, and I'm going to be the nice Joe Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, am I like the nice Joe Jackson, Neil? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. good. <laughs> and so I, I felt that, because my dad and I have talked about this, was that, you know, during... During the horror story of American slavery, black men were not allowed to be fathers, right? Every decision was made by the master, the owner, right? So if I was a father back then, I couldn't say my son's going to go to Chapman or my other son's going to go to Columbia or my daughter's going to go to Fordham. I couldn't do that. The, the master would make those decisions. They'd probably get rid of me, keep mom around a little longer and get rid of my ass. So for generations, we didn't have black fathers. So suddenly we get free, you know, we have the 13th Amendment, and, and now we, we get to be dads, but we don't have our father game together. So it takes us a couple generations of going, oh, wow. And it's the best love ever, man. If you, you, it's not having the kids, it's well, making this one. But it's not the having them. It's not just the having them, it's the being the father. That is just, it's like the best love ever, man. And so I, I knew, even though I didn't have kids then, that I wanted to have kids. I'm a weird man. I should and I thought it would be interesting to show this working black father with a daughter. So I borrowed someone's baby. <laughs> I borrowed her baby. I said, I will give me a pouch. And I want, I, I'm on the weekend. I'm working. But I want to keep my daughter close to me. I want that contact so she can feel daddy's voice. So she's used to that man voice. She's not frightened of that man. She knows that man voice, that, that there's love there. And you see the way that, that my character treats the, the child, the future. And then with the way Nino Brown, the drug dealer, he picks up the little girl as the bulletproof fat, flat vest. So it, even in the symbolism of it, you saw one cat didn't really care about the future, wasn't thinking beyond his own self, and the other father was. And that's what I wanted. And then I got to have kids later in life. And I dragged them every premiere with me. And, and um, it's wonderful, you know. So, so I, 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 again, I, I was really happy to have two languages with my father. One was father-son, and the other one was director, writer, actor, director. You know, so we had a work language. Didn't mean that I would, would necessarily be in the same business as him, but I would learn work ethic. And so I wanted that sense that this father took his baby girl with him to work and let her see this happen. Maybe one day she'll grow up and be the police commissioner. <laughs> uh, Where's the child now? I don't know. I'm probably just going to come up to me one day and go, you know, I, that happens to me all the time where someone I've met, you know, you know, years ago will come up and, and close the gap. This is me. My perspective on realism. Um, well, I think that, you know, it changes from film to film. So I don't, the way I would, one of the things that I've enjoyed is not just doing features, but doing episodic. It's a really interesting discipline because when I go to direct, uh, I directed a show called Lost, I don't give them what I want to give them. I give them the best version of what they want to have. It's like I don't give my, my kids a Christmas present that I want them to have. I try to give them the best version of what they want to have. 
So the way that I would direct a film like New Jack City, which is sort of a hyper-realism, would not be the same way that I would tell a story when I'm directing Bloodline, or when I'm directing, I'm doing Wu-Tang Clan right now, the American Saga. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that, that has a whole different vibe. So, um, what I know is this, it's something I talked to Michael Mann about, was that any time the camera is doing things that your eye doesn't naturally do, it hydroplanes a little bit from reality. So you have to be conscious of that. And I knew that early on with New Jack City, I wanted to, to take it into a hyper-reality, that it wasn't New York City, it was a New Jack City. So I wanted to play with that, which allows the viewer to kind of flow through it with an energy. But if I was doing um, a documentary, if I was doing something like, oh, the way my dad does Sweetback, it's, it's got a realism to it, there's a grit to it, there's a different texture to it, the way I did my Western posse, um, there's a different, thank you, thank you. There, there's, there, oh, okay, we've got some cowboys over here, all right. Um, so so each, each time I try to speak a different cinematic language and, not, and, and come at it fresh. Yeah. Oh, the source material for New Jack City. Uh, Rayful Edmonds, Felix Mitchell, Nicky Barnes. Nicky Barnes was in New York. You guys know Nicky Barnes? Yeah, he was Mr. Untouchable in New York, real cat, like a Nino Brown kind of brother. Um, but basically, once the, the hard drugs were coming into the black community, these were guys who sort of did for the drugs what Ford did for the auto plant. And uh, unfortunately, it was uh, that, that, that F this up. That's hurt our communities. Yeah. We have time for about two more questions. Um, thank you so much for the Q&A, because it's like listening to the gospel, because we are filmmakers. So when you were speaking to people that are starting, it really fills us with inspiration. So thank you. Do you miss working with celluloid? Because when I see these pictures are so beautiful and the grain is so wonderful when it's coming from 35 millimeter. Do you miss it for cinematic purposes? Do I miss, uh, do I miss film? Yes, I do. Um, but I have to say, because I'm also an actor, is the ability to get into that mix and be, do it again, do it again. Go again, go again, right away. Jump in. Am I right, Mandela? Like how you can jump in and do a scene and just do it, repeat it. There's a freshness to that. And as an actor director, if I'm doing a scene with this cat right here, imagine we're in a scene together and the camera's here. Because I'm acting with it, I get to see the truth first. It's amazing. You know, so I'm right there. I'm not down the street looking at a monitor. You know, because I'm right, right there. So I like to be real close to the performance. And the, the freedom that that allows you um, to not have to reload constantly. Not only that, the economic freedom that filmmakers can go, I'm not tied down to that kind of money. When my father made his first feature film, what happened was I was with my dad, I guess I was two, that's what he told me. He could be full of shit. <laughs> but my dad tells great stories. I never know what's real or what's Memorex, right? But the way he tells it, I was in a movie theater with him, he took me to all these movies, and we saw, actually we saw a lot of westerns first. And in the westerns, the Chinese guy was the deferential houseboy Hopsi. The Hispanic guy was the oily bandit who didn't need no sticking badges. Women were pale and frail and needed rescuing. Uh, black folks were scared and shuffling. And the only good Indian was a dead Indian. And so if you weren't white male in a Western, in those early Westerns, you were pretty jacked up. So we'd watch these Westerns. And eventually my dad just got pissed off. And we went into the booth and the editing, the guy was screening the movie, and he said, how long is the movie? And he said, the movie's actually, you know, about 90 minutes. He said, how much does 90 minutes of film cost? And the guy told him, and 24 frames a second, and my dad's a mathematician. So he went out and bought 90 minutes worth of 35 millimeter film, and he shot his first movie. But he never thought about editing. <laughs> he never thought about take two. <laughs> So when stuff went wrong, he's like, oh shit, my movie's 80 minutes now. Do you know what I mean? And by the time he got it done, and I'm in the movie, uh, it was about 12 minutes long. <laughs> right? 
That was an expensive endeavor that the family had to pay for. So then he, he wised up and he got 18 millimeter, I mean 16 millimeter, excuse me. <laughs> and so he shot 16 millimeter and he started doing more, more films and more films and eventually he got better at it. But it's, it's less expensive for a young filmmaker now to go out and do it. So the accessibility is there. We will always want stories, right? We'll always need that. You just have to have good stories. Don't just worry about how it looks or the medium it's shot on. Tell me a good story. Tell me a good story. Can I have this young brother right here? Big voice, use your big voice. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for being here and for um, answering all the questions and for speaking your incredible movies. It's just been such a pleasure to be here. Um, my question is, uh, considering some of the extremely controversial meetings that the movie touches upon, um, especially considering the time when we had Roger Payne, most of the Iran Contra affair around that time, um, what was the pushback like from the studio and how did you handle that? Good, that's a good question, man. They're very nice going, well, you, know, you know some smart Negroes. <laughs> you brought them in, I see you got some college education, I got you, son. And they have been come back with some of the big words. What was the controversial push? <laughs> um, okay, so I think to some degree, uh, you know, when my dad did sweep back, I said, Dad, how come you never really got another job offer after that? He said, well, listen, if you go into a pool hall and you pretend you can't play pool, and they, you take all the bets, and then you run the table, you can't go back into that same pool hall. He said, I had made the mistake of winning in Hollywood without their money, without their marketing, without their advertising, and without their permission. They weren't going to have me back, because I'm Trump, right? So that's when he went on to Broadway and did his thing. The difference with me here is that I got to make my film inside the system to some degree. Again, it was a negative pickup. So they had sort of a, you know, a plausible deniability, if you will. There was a certain distance, and I could play my black car. So one of the execs wrote some notes, and there's a scene where Ice-T says, Yo, Hobbs, you know what time it is. And the exec wrote, Oh, I don't understand. He has money. Why doesn't he just wear a watch? Be like okay, so I, I I played my black card all day long. Um, so there was a certain sense of well, well these guys are going to go off and make that do your thing, do your black thing, like that kind of deal. Um, but but we were aware that I mean we had a smart script. We had Barry Michael Cooper who had written articles for the Village Voice, and he came up with these lines where you know Nino's comparing it to the to Joe Kennedy who made his money bootlegging, and then his son became. A president said so there was some heavy stuff, even at the end when, when he's on the stand and we said, you know, kick the ballistics, we don't have poppy fields in the ghetto, we don't have gun manufacturing plants in the ghetto, but we go to jail for it every day, so this is bigger than me. So we knew we were kind of stepping into some dangerous territory and asking some interesting questions, but that's what I like, that's part of the band people's legacy, we like to do that, you know. Uh, so. I, I just started, I just ran with it, and then when they saw the movie, they are like, oh shit, we got something, and then when the reviews kicked off, we had it, but yeah, it, there were some sensitivities, um, definitely, and then in the Western too, because again, in Posse, I, I, I threaded the needle there, and uh, we got a little pushback, but I, we sort of got it through, yeah. Thank you, good question, though, brother. Oh, we got so many people with Okay, TLC, what's happening? <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for seeing you, honestly, and showing up. But I'm so curious to know what's next for you. What's next for me? Oh, okay. Wow, okay, so um, I'm, did, um, I'm doing Wu Tang Clan right now. So I'm doing that, and that's fun, man. And I'm working with RZA. Bro, the other night, I was out till 6 a.m. with RZA and Busta Rhymes at the studio. That and Busta can, and then do, do, do the freestyle, and I'm like, oh shit, because don't let rappers don't try to do that, man. That's going to get ugly. Um, I'm doing that, and I'm probably uh, getting ready. You know, the movie gods always make you a liar, so you have to be careful, because you think you're going to do this, and you wind up doing that. But I, we're starting to work up to do another Western. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 
And this time we're going to have some badass sisters in the saddle. You know? Right? Okay, I see you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that's pretty exciting because it's, you know, um, Dr. King said we all, we either all are to live together as brothers and sisters or we perish together as fools. And to add to that, now we have to live, live together as brothers and sisters, also in harmony with nature, or perish together as fools. And, and I, I like to mix it up. So in this Western, you know, you'll see the black Western or the white Western. I like to make the people Western. And, and I think that's what's going to, what I'm probably gonna, hopefully going to get to do next. Yeah. Thank you for asking me. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I know that was a beautiful little for us to end on. Please join me again. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming and hanging out.